Welcome everyone to the Rethink It podcast, a podcast designed for equipping families and individuals struggling with brain health issues to identify practical, natural health science and lifestyle approaches to restore optimal brain health and prevent dementia. My podcast, my newsletter, my website, and my integrative practice all focus on providing down-to-earth solutions for upgrading and protecting brain health. This podcast is meant to supply women with brain fog and chronic health issues with the knowledge to choose affordable, effective tools and techniques that go beyond brain hacking. The goal is to preserve your quality of life, your health, your freedom, and your independence. I'm excited you're here today. I'm Sandy, your host for the next 30 minutes to an hour. For the next six months, as we try to get the word out there about this podcast content, we are offering a very special promotion. We will be doing a drawing to give away a free MRT food sensitivity test, which samples the top 88 common food sensitivities. This test has a value of $399, and we will be giving it away for free. MRT is the most advanced and reliable test for hidden inflammatory reactions to foods and food chemicals, and it identifies your best foods. So this is not an allergen test. This is a food sensitivity test. This helps you when you identify your best foods and all those hidden inflammatory reactions. It helps you make a strategic food plan in order to rapidly reduce systemic and digestive inflammation which improves outcomes of any other digestive health program that you're currently participating in. This is something I do for a lot of my clients um, in order to rapidly get ahead of the inflammation that they're dealing with. For more information about the test, please go to our website, beyondbrainhealth.com and check out the Direct to You Labs. We'll We'll also provide a link for you in the show notes. So you can check that out as well if that's an easier direction for you. But as I said above, I am excited to offer this test, this $399 test to you for free. Here's how you qualify to get it for free, okay? So I'm gonna warn you, since this test is almost $400, there are a few steps you must follow to qualify for this drawing. Okay, it's a $400 test, so it's not just one step, you guys. (laughs) So here we go. Go to your show notes on whatever podcaster you're listening on, whether it's Google, Apple, or Spotify. Give us a rating, good or bad. I appreciate both. And comment on the podcast. I really appreciate the honest feedback, especially as I'm growing and learning this whole podcasting education process. I want you guys to really enjoy our time together. So let me know how I'm doing. All right, number two, step number two, you will also follow us on Instagram or Facebook, please. And give us a comment there as well. Those links should also be found on every single episode of our show notes. So you just need to open the show notes that you're listening on right now and, you know, click, click the link to your Instagram or Facebook, um, whichever you guys prefer social media platform that you prefer to be on and follow us there and give us a comment. And lastly, to qualify for the drawing, please share this podcast with at least one person. Okay. Okay. So to sum up, you're giving us a rating on your favorite podcaster, whichever one you prefer. You're going to follow us on the podcast and on Instagram or Facebook, whichever you're on, and give us a comment on both. And lastly, you're going to share this content with at least one person. That's a few steps, but it shouldn't take you more than 60 seconds to complete all three. We will be doing the drawing on December 15th, 2023. So let's get the word out there. Welcome back, everyone, to the Rethink It podcast. I'm so excited to be here today to continue our conversation about brain health protection and longevity. Our podcast today is called Trauma Brain, Rethinking the Link Between Trauma and Brain Fog, Chronic Fatigue, and Dementia. This is a special episode since this is my is the first guest interview this season, and boy, do I have a treat for you guys. My guest is Dr. Elizabeth Barchiani, and she is one of my top favorite people on this planet. She is a licensed neuropsychologist in Northern Virginia, in the Northern Virginia region, um, who specializes in brain health testing and behavioral therapy. Her dissertation was focused on the emotional and behavioral changes that occur with with regional strokes 
which is a topic I find fascinating and definitely under addressed in the full scope of brain recovery after stroke. I thought that she would be a great person to interview following the last episode on ADHD and the link with dementia because her primary practice focus is in neurological disorders across the lifespan, including neurodevelopmental and degenerative disorders that include some um, things like infectious neurological disorders like neuroborreliosis, or in other words, for those of you who are more familiar with Lyme brain, um, stroke. She focuses on TBI, which is traumatic, traumatic brain injury, and concussion recovery. She sees patients ages four years and older with conditions including ADHD, autism, long-haul COVID, and she works with individuals, couples, and families. Dr. Varchiani has an interesting professional journey, beginning with a bachelor's in, in Spanish. So she's a, another one of those multi-talented people <laughs> that I know in my world. She joined the Air Force to attend the Defense Language Institute in California and completed her training in Arabic before working at the NSA while completing her psychology degree. So she's just, you know, just really dumb. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> she has been in practice since 2018. Welcome, Dr. Vargiani, to our podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yay. I'm so glad you're here. So I want to start out by asking you to share what inspired you to focus your education and, um, and psychology practice in the area of brain health. You want to share some of that? Yeah, thanks for asking. I was really interested in the way people interacted. I feel like I wanted to work with people in behavioral health for a very long time. I always was the type of kid that was observing others, my family, um, and specifically in neuro, I, you know, as a child, I struggled with my own attention and learning issues, and I always wanted to figure out what made my own brain tick. And uh, as I got older, you know, I had some nephews and my own son who had struggled with um, ADHD, and I really just found it really fascinating to, you know, observe their progress and their whole testing process and the I relationship bet, between some of I the bet it made it that. like really make sense right <laughs> like what you're seeing to just kind of yeah. for me it's just fascinating to um, like put those you know connections together where we you, you what you see in real life has a under you can explain it to some degree I mean there's a mystery in everything but you can explain it to some degree when you see something tangible in a scan or 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 reproducible even on testing and stuff like that i find that so fascinating it's it's validating to what you're seeing personally and around you right it is very very much validating because what you see you can test for it and it comes back and you know what's what the client is going to do because you know what their history is yeah and it it's also comes up I, I think, you know, when you, you you don't know anything except what you see in front of your face. And I think that sometimes people tend to think that they're crazy <laughs> when they're yeah. dealing with things or they're the only person. They're the so. only person, especially right. people with ADHD. It's that, you know, your wheels are spinning at different paces or you feel like you're holding water. Like you understand what's going on, but it just slips through your fingers and you can't reproduce it in an academic setting or in a standard setting with other kids who they, whose brains are more neurotypical per se. Yeah. And it's a very frustrating, very frustrating life to have. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to fit a, a non-neurotypical person into a, into a box of the everyday world is just... It's just not work. fair. It's very discouraging to that person. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so in, in my defense, I'm most neuropsychologists I've met are somewhere in the neuroatypical spectrum. I'm not, I must speak on everybody, but a I think everybody's chunk, a good, a good for, chunk. <laughs> hey, look, there's a reason I'm in uh, holistic health because I was trying yeah. to understand my health. And, you know, it, I think psychologists get uh, there. I think there's a really important role there because the compassion they develop because of they had to develop for, for themselves and being patient with their own selves, yeah. like in their neuro atypical selves, you know, with ADHD or whatever it is. Um, it makes them really be able to serve people in a way that's unique. And I, that, you know, those of us that don't have that necess don't necessarily think we have that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Um, don't, don't have the ability to do so. But that's really great. So, um, it, you know, I want to just kind of bring you on because there's a lot of 
questions I had that wanted, I wanted to follow up on. And, and I really touched on trauma um, and the effect it has on the brain and the effect it can have long term um, leading to things that can uh, leading to changes that could cause dementia um, in my last podcast. So I just kind of wanted to pick your brain a little bit on that. But I do have a lot of clients in, in the chronic fatigue space that have Lyme brain. And I know I see a lot of that in my practice. And we can touch a little bit in a, in a, in a minute about how trauma, uh, you know, how people with Lyme have a history of trauma and those, those, you know, statistics. I'm sure you know those more than I do, but um, in my practice, because I see a lot of that, um, do you, do you mind sharing with our audience how, what you've seen in the research and stuff like that about how Lyme affects the brain and the thinking and the emotions? Yes, Lyme is very interesting. Lyme literally affects the short-term memory. When I test people with Lyme disease, it, they can tell me in passing during a clinical interview, oh, it's biotic, and I'm here for ADHD testing, da 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 But uh, as soon as I start testing them, lo and behold, it's the same pattern every single time. They have short-term memory problems. That's that's really what I see. Another common finding is emotional symptoms. They tend to be more prone to depression, more prone to anxiety. Fatigue is a really common finding. So these things that I, I recently tested a kid, well, about a year ago, and I don't think he even knew that he had Lyme. His mom knew about it and he was mm -hmm. a kid. And when I did the feedback, he was like, I have Lyme. <laughs> it was oh, very so interesting, cute. but it was case. What, in, what was that know, age? The age the of kid that was 15, I think. Okay. He, he was a 15 year old kid, but it was, it was um, really like a puzzle fit perfectly. He had no short term memory. He had all of his uh, observer and self report measures were fatigue, 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 and emotional symptoms. And mm -hmm. it was, very classic and i was like this is not adhd he has a lime mm -hmm. yeah so. exactly so that's really um it's really interesting i i mean i've done my own little research but i'm not of course i'm not an expert at looking at brain scans have you have you ever like looked at brain scans of people with lyme disease and like if you have what do you typically see there well the research seems to indicate that there's widespread inflammation it doesn't appear to be one particular region just briefly looking at scans not from personal clients they don't typically bring me brain scans for Lyme disease but from what I've seen it, there may be some stuff going on in the right hemisphere but generally what I see and what the research is showing is that there's widespread inflammation across the whole brain totally makes like, sense yeah totally makes sense I've seen I've seen uh, in my practice um, when I start going after the bugs in the brain, mm -hmm. um, the Lyme, you know, the Lyme bacteria that are often hidden in parasites, FYI, um, I get global, if we're not careful and we are too aggressive, we'll get global inflammation in the brain and it literally, they, their pain, their whole head hurts and it's, it's a form of encephalitis, I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, and what you said about the right hemisphere is kind of interesting because, um, you know, I don't know if you can help people understand just the right left hemisphere and how that looks on a, you know, what that looks like in clinical presentation or when people are like, well, what does that even mean for me? <laughs> you know, yeah. like typically, right, a, a right stroke on the right side of the hemisphere is going to lead to left sided symptoms. Am I right? A right a hemis a stroke that would affect the right hemisphere means the right hemisphere is not working. So you're going to have more working. You're going to have more function on the left side. So a right hemisphere stroke, oh, you're going to see more secret. denial, more apathy, more everything's okay. Versus the left hemisphere stroke, you're going to have catastrophic emotional symptoms, dramatic, more depression, more anxiety. So that's mm -hmm. generally what we see. Mm -hmm. So I often see um, what I find confusing to me and i'm not 100 percent sure what the deal is is i see people with um my lyme clients with kind of a lot of that emotionality but then also with uh, dominantly left often left-sided pain i don't know why what that's all about or but you know maybe you can talk, yeah. talk about that i've seen that too with some clients when i i i have recently spoke to somebody and they they were saying exactly what you're saying left-sided pains or the Maybe just more inflammation. So, if there is 
some kind of damage going on in the right hemisphere. It could be that the pain is moving to the left hemisphere. It's more active. So maybe mm-hmm. that's why they're feeling it more. On I, I'm not really sure the reason, but it does seem I have seen exactly what you're saying. And mm-hmm. I've seen that also with clients. They complain about the left side pain. And keep in mind that that's probably a more neurotypical presentation because a lot of left-handed people, their brains are switched uh-huh. to the right hemisphere. Good point. Yeah. yeah. Like that left so, is... Yeah. Those unicorn lefties. Yes. <laughs> they always and throw curveballs in my world. <laughs> they will. They really do. You got to ask them if they're left, left-handed left or right-handed because uh, uh, about, I don't remember the percentage exactly, so don't quote me on that, but it's a good chunk of left-handed people. Their language is on the right side, so they get a stroke and then they lose language and you're like, are you left-handed? Oh, yeah, you're left-handed. Okay, that makes total sense. So you're supposed to lose visual spatial skills, but you're losing language. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. could the little atypical it's atypical yeah. I, yeah. My, but atypical does not mean bad atypical no. just means that's how god made you <laughs> and that's it's, how god made you yeah that's yeah, right so i just want to just for the sake of the audience and for people who've never actually been to a psychologist or a neuropsychologist or ever thought about or maybe they're just scared because they don't know what can you just talk about kind of the testing that you do to help identify neurodevelopmental problems or deficits or even degenerative, like what kind of testing do you do with your clients? What's that typically look like? Um, well, it depends on their age. So kids, you you want to do a, a little bit more because of their age and their development. So I always do a cognitive, which is IQ. It's a full broad span IQ um, testing. They Then you want to test motor because their motor is still developing. You want to test a continuance performance task for um, ADHD, but that tends to also pick up like on cortical difficulties, subcortical patterns. What does um, that mean? Um, so generally it could pick up on like atypical patterns. Like it could, for ADHD, you typically on a continuance performance test have problems missing targets and maybe responding too fast to targets. This is on a computer. Tar- test. Oh, okay. Like, what, yeah. what's a, a target? It's, like a, it's a. Oh, sorry. I, I forgot. To mention you went that. straight into your 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 professional language. <laughs> yes. Sorry about that. We put a, a. I like to tell kids you're playing a video game, so they get put on a, a computer, and like letters pop up, and I tell you hit all the letters except for the letter X, and then oh. so they hit the space bar, and the letter X pops up, and then they they hit it, and they're like, oh no, I messed up. So it's like a video game. That's cool. And so, yeah, so we're measuring a lot of things like how fast I they respond. I could totally send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I have it. Cool. <laughs> Gotta get my use out of it. Right? Yeah. But it it's um. It, it's interesting because you can see performance patterns and their res- how fast they respond, how impulsive they are if they lose. Uh, so with attention deficit, you see a lot of times they forget to respond or they respond too quick. So it's a little, oh, no. And then that, that towards the end, they just kind of get worse and worse and worse because they don't have the, the sustained attention. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but with other ones, you might see some like rigidity, res- rigid responsing or anx- anxiety. People respond really quickly to things. So you just see so much. I could see... Um, all kinds of patterns with that so that's yeah, awesome all kinds of, yeah what about I dementia what do you do dementia oh i give the cpt i give the continuance performance test to everybody um but what does that I, look like what's a CPT? It's a, that, uh, cpt is what i just described oh okay um so we do the same thing i want for dementia you don't really i do full testing because I want to get a whole picture and I want people to know exactly where they are from the start. When I retest them, I can do a little bit more specified, like specific testing for them so they don't have to repeat the process. But if somebody who's brand new to me, I want to do a cognitive test. I want to test the processing speed. I want to test their working memory. So their executive function. And then I want to test their memories, short-term memories. I want to test their, um, there's a test that it's a complex figure that we give. So that's a really good one for dementia. So you get presented a very complex figure and you tell them to copy it. And then you tell them to cop, they take it away and then they have to copy it from memory and then do it again 15 minutes later. And you could see their de- the de- decline, decline of, or the even memory. how they're, yeah, even how they're, how they're going about putting this complex, abnormal, non-logical um, figure together. And it's really interesting to watch. It's a very good one for dementia, I feel like. 
um, and I do a little less with motor, but sometimes I do a little motor with them. And then, of course, I do a little personality just to see what's going on because you do see personality changes across the span and you want to measure any uh, levels of anxiety and depression and things like that when you're testing. So that's generally a full comprehensive neuropsych test. And it's pretty similar uh, across ages. Only difference is I do more learning disorder testing for kids because they need it. Sure. And it's- does, does that testing include... Um- um, testing from subjective sources like mom and dad and stuff like that mm-hmm. or, yes. or or a husband and wife if it's dementia. Yeah. Yes. For children, you have to have three observations. You need one in school and you need one at home and you need their self-report. Oh. And for uh, older, adult and up, I need at least two. I need oh. at home or in their self-report. Gotcha. A minimum gotcha. of two. Yeah. So I'm just going to circle back to Lyme because it's a big thing in my story and certainly for my, um, you know, my clients. So, um, you know, you touched on your your uh, client that you had there that was 15 years old and had Lyme. Uh, you know, one of the shocking facts for me to, sco- to discover when I was dealing with my son's Lyme disease was that the actual highest age group that affects Lyme disease is five to nine years old. Did you believe, you believe that? Yeah, I believe it. It makes total sense. Those kids are outside playing. Yeah, yeah. I really don't remember learning that in my medical training. Um, So my question is, do you think that those Lyme, since it affects that age group, do you think it's a legitimate potential cause of a lot of ADHD or learning disorders? It's not a cause of ADHD or learning disorders, but it certainly can uh, complicate the presentation. So ADHD is usually we'll see uh, obviously starting around age of three, peaking at age of six and getting better after that. But you have to have symptoms before the age of 12 to diagnose it. Mm-hmm. So um, what you do see is a lot of people, they come in and they start going to school and they are having trouble learning and they're having emotional issues. And they're like, oh, that must be ADHD. So often they don't even know that just they got bit by a tick. Then nothing came up in this in their Lyme testing or even they even got tested. And so they get diagnosed with ADHD. And if they and that doesn't mean they don't already have ADHD. ADHD kids are gonna are perfectly able to be bit by ticks as well. So that can definitely complicate their learning. And of course, if your short term memory is impacted, it's gonna impact your ability to learn new information and retain it. So yeah, yeah. Like it, it certainly can impact their schooling and um, memories. And stuff like that. So it definitely can contribute. Yeah, in some you know aspects to either worsening or. I feel like um, we, we talked about it in my last podcast on, um, you know, ADHD and the link to dementia, um, you know, the multifaceted causes of ADHD. It's one of those complicated things. So yeah. I definitely think that an infectious origin can definitely be a source that contributes to that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So um, I know this talk isn't really only about Lyme disease, but we, and we do want to talk about like optimizing brain health for the future. But I am seeing a ton of new Lyme diagnoses these days. Um, like I said, in my last two podcasts, podcasts, <laughs> I talked about the connection between neurodevelopmental disorders like ADHD and neurodegenerative ones like dementia. Do you, do you see that link in your practice or have you seen that in the research at all? I This is new research, actually. When I was in grad school, that wasn't like a very big thing that came out, uh, but there has been a research. It's a, a new one I, I came across. It's a big groundbreaking research. It was done at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, and they did a huge uh, multi-generational longitudinal study, and they were able to control for any of the other variables, uh, such as sleep, high blood pressure, and instead of which other researchers were not really, it didn't seem like they were able to do, or they would say, well, this is maybe due to sleep problems or maybe due to high blood pressure or Mm -hmm. et cetera. They were able to control for all these factors and they were able to find a link that associated with ADHD with a higher risk of dementia, which can be anywhere or mild cognitive impairment. So dementia is a little bit broader. Mild cognitive impairment is more like the beginning. Yeah, the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> you lose something, but you can still function. Dementia, you, you can't really function. Right. So, but the rate is somewhere between 30 to 50% more likely. Based Holy on cow. That's huge. And that sounds like, I mean, that sounds like a really yes. good study. I mean, like it is. controlled all those variables. Mm-hmm. That's a, 
huge. That is groundbreaking. Of course, I, I wonder. Uh, we haven't heard much about that in the press, have we? <laughs> That's no, we haven't. It, I, <laughs> I did. I, as a psychologist, I just came across it recently as I was doing some research for another project I was doing, and I was like, "What is this?" Because I, I, you know, if somebody yeah. asked me, I've been like, "Well, people with ADHD usually don't sleep as well. Sleep deprivation is absolutely linked to increased dementia or maybe anxiety." Is, yes. But they controlled for these variables, right. and they still found the link. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, so talk to me. Um, what do you think? You just mentioned uh, sleep and, you know, like, talk to me about that risk. This is something like lifestyle stuff is what, what this podcast is about. It's kind of about biohacking your brain, you know. And so every every podcast, I really try to drive home, you know, what people can do to help prevent and preserve and protect their brain. So you talked about sleep and the risk to de- with dementia. What what does the research show on that? Like what- Sleep. Sleep is highly related to um, like lack of, sleep. lack of sleep. People who have difficulties with REM sleep, and there's an increased risk for Parkinson's and Parkinsonian dementias. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely something to think about if there's somebody with a sleep disorder or who has like a, a, a actual sleep disorder or REM or doesn't have REM cycles or yeah has various sleep difficulties. Right. Yeah. Their risk is certainly higher. Yeah, that's, that's a, you know, there was a um, article that came out back when I, this must have been 2007. I mean, it was like a long time ago. I, it, it was right after I finished uh, PA school and, and I was getting one of the medical journals and it came out about, it was about sleep apnea. And it was a very big article talking about how, you know, people with sleep apnea have a higher risk for dementia. And they said the reason for that was because of the disrupted sleep and then the catecholamine surges that occurred, you know, and then blah, 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 That's blah, right. changes all the brain function. But the point was, is that the sleep was, it, the sleep apnea affected the sleep, which affected the brain. So again, you know, that sleep function, if we're dealing with sleep deficits and, and you know, what causes disordered sleep, that's a whole other podcast. But, you know, like, for sure, one thing people um, who are trying to protect their brain need to be focusing on is sleep hygiene, right? Healthy sleep That's hygiene. That's absolutely right. That's and absolutely if you have right. ADHD too, obviously, you know. Absolutely. And yes, which comes first, chicken or egg? You know, <laughs> I have ADHD, so I'm insomniac, you know. And, and so many acts. So now I have worse uh, memory problems. Right. ADHD is something you have to remember. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder. Many people right. have ADHD as children, but as they get older, they may not qualify for ADHD. We're talking mm-hmm. adult ADHD. That's probably a more severe case as children too. Even mm-hmm. inattentive types that aren't really jumping off the wall, they tend to tend to be a little bit worse because they do get better and they do outgrow their symptoms. yeah. You know, you just gave me a great um, uh, segue into my next question because you're talking about adult ADHD and that's more severe. And would you say a lot of times when you see that in an adult that sometimes that's most of the time that has an environmental factor involved in it, whether it's trauma or an exposure to something like, uh, I don't know, toxins or fluoride or mold or something like that? Don't you, would you say that those have, that's a high risk or... Yeah, so not to give you a leading question here, but <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's, I know what you're saying. Well, the, the thing with fluoride and toxins, well, fluoride has been linked to hyperactivity, especially in children. Mm-hmm. Um, there, it, an increased risk of ADHD, so mm-hmm. it's not really recommended. Mm-hmm. Um, and toxins and mold and all these things that can create inflammation and lead exposure. I mean, they've found that in houses. Of I mean, they took it out of houses in 1977, I believe. Yeah, but we still find it in houses. And, and we still find it. In inner cities, you have a higher rate of uh, you know, mental health issues across the board. I don't want to just say ADHD because it's anywhere from ADHD to schizophrenia to autism to right. et cetera. There's a lot of things. And there's... Uh, foods impacted and the mold in the houses and things like that. I saw yeah. that a lot working with inner city. It was the, the mental health issues were more, more severe than they are up in the suburbs. You know? Wow. That's pretty, yeah. that's a pretty impressive statement yeah. that, that they were yeah. more severe in the inner city. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you just testing cause I do all the, the you know, the toxin testing and gut yeah. testing, all that stuff. You're, you'll be surprised the adults that I come across with toxic lead mm-hmm. in their system you know i like believe it lead i'm like 
wow. Okay. <laughs> old houses that aren't maintained and if they're having, you know, financial issues and yeah. they're living in subsidized housing, they're not getting clean housing the way right. it right. was. Before. Well, I mean, I'm talking about people in the suburbs even. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, older houses that love for old houses, right? We just got to yeah. have those old houses with the old pipes. You got to repair Oh, they're, they're charming, but they're... <laughs> <laughs> they're they're definitely a, a different risk. time yeah yeah and you know uh i want to talk about the fluoride just for a second because fluoride is definitely something that i have a specific interest in just because of yeah. you know my work in anesthesia where we use um, a fluoridated <sighs> gas to kind of help you go to sleep and so there are definitely links with brain inflammation and deficits with exposure to fluoride can Absolutely. you talk to me about that? Because I know there was this huge study. I I came across it. I was shocked. I mean, this was like the, the I, I can't tell you how many people I still talk to that go, but fluoride's good for my teeth. And and wait a minute, I'm supposed to be having fluoride, right? What, aren't we supposed to have it in our water? And that kind of thing. And this study came out, I want to say in 20, 2002 or 2001. I mean, it was 20 years ago. It was, it's an old study. And it was a huge longitudinal study retrospective and it looked at uh and it, it, it was the first i would say groundbreaking study that came out saying the showing the link between um the, the neurodevelopmental like you were talking about adhd and those type of things um and exposure to fluoride now this was not new this was new in the u.s uh in the 1990s and the 1980s fluoride was a huge contamination issue in india and they have tons of literature on the risks and the immune effects like it's immune suppressing and brain effects and all these things from from those studies back in the 80s and 90s but so talk to me about what you what you expect to see with fluoride or how it affects the brain well there's an increased risk of it, uh, hyperactivity that's noticed noted in a lot of ex exposure to fluoride early on. So you get a little bit more hyperactivity, attention and learning if issues is what you usually are expected to see. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there was a study came out maybe 10 years ago um, about it. And it was kind of shook the anesthesia world a little bit because it showed that kids that had multiple anesthetics early in life had a I, shift in IQ, a reduction yes, in IQ. That's right. That's right. That actually is um, that they found to people who have um, areas that are concentrated in cities with uh, uh, concentrated fluoride, their IQs were uh, like lower than the population mm -hmm. outside of those areas. So it doesn't optimize your health. So I, I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah and, and again, you know, anesthetics yeah. have uh, concentrated fluoride as part of what yeah. we manage. <laughs> and yeah. especially, especially in children, because they don't like to get, we don't like to stick babies, <laughs> you know, with IVs That's and stuff right. while they're awake and stuff. Well, that's really interesting. But I consider um, trauma as an also emotional trauma as sort of an environmental factor that can affect brain health. Um, that's at least what I see in my practice, it's definitely something I'm screening for and somebody with complex health issues. As a psychologist, how do you define trauma? Trauma is any adverse experience that you would, that, any type of adverse experience. Now that's very general, so I'll go to specific. Usually it's associated with abuse, which could be physical abuse. It could be social, psychological abuse. Bullying counts as trauma. It is abuse. Um, bullying by your family, scapegoating by family. They see that in family systems. Um, and then, of course, sexual abuse, which could lead to a much very complex case of PTSD, mm -hmm. body image issues. Like I said, in my practice um, and holistic work, I... I often recognize the powerful effect that early trauma and emotion have on healing, which is why I keep you in my back pocket. People like you, <laughs> you know, because it, you know, if I don't deal with this, the trauma, then I, I, sometimes they just plateau and I can't get them well without addressing those stuck, stuck issues right. because they're really there. And, and not to sound very hyper spiritual about how healing works or mystical because it's not mystical um, the way electrons move in space is nothing, it's not mystical, it's science, <laughs> but um, emotions affect the way electrons move in space. That's why I, I, I group it 
in the category of uh, a toxin because negative emotions, they're negative, that implies a charge. <laughs> they literally are um, electron stealers. They rob electrons from our cells, which means that they're affecting energy, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so back, you know, so like I said, the, the energy shift in your cell that occurs when you're experiencing a trauma is literally a shift in the way the electrons move in your cells. So it does That's physically right. have a manifestation. At least I can understand it from a quantum physiology or quantum biology perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, can you talk to me a little bit about how you feel emotions impact the ability of people to heal physically and, and how like physical symptoms might be associated with un unresolved trauma? Um, trauma is interesting because you also see cross generational trauma. I see a lot with Holocaust survivors. With I've what? Worked with, with Holocaust survivors. Oh I, wow! I actually had patients from that too, and they they come to me. Oh, I have an anxiety disorder, and I do a clinical interview, and they're talking about their grandparents who were Holocaust survivors, and then their parents came in, and they're still creating this cross generational trauma and they're talking about it three generations later so wow. it, it yeah. actually can have epigenetic cha make epigenetic changes in the person's body which they pass down to future generations talk to me about that what's epigenetic what do you mean by that epigenetic is You're introducing not just a term genetic. That I love to talk yes. to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's not just genetic it is when your genes are alter in response to X, Y, or Z. So it could be toxins, fluoride, a bad living in situation or trauma because trauma increases your cortisol, increases your ability to stay alert, mm -hmm. which can affect your future generations generally. It's long, so good. Like, in, in short. <laughs> that's yeah, short. that's a short story. Yeah, that's, that's, a short story. that's a really good, you know, in the first, the first studies I came across on when I was really trying to look into epigenetics, it was actually in psychology, like psychology journals. They were the yes. first to really talk about how, That's right. um, you know, say PTSD led to a higher risk of um, suicide in subsequent generations, things like that. Subsequent. That's right. Subsequent. So like they, like dad had PTSD and granddaughter is now more prone to, or grandson is more prone to um, suicide risk. That's right. Isn't that interesting? That's so crazy. That's right. Yes. Yeah, it, it's partly physiologically changing and it is partly imagine that you're coming from a family that experienced that and then they have certain rules in their family and they treat their children a certain way and their children have to heal emotionally while having a greater risk factor of having anxiety right. and not being able to handle the anxiety because they're born with a high anxious, more of an anxious temperament. Right. You know, and yeah. so you got a lot, it gets messy. It really takes us several generations to get better. Yeah. And it's, it takes intentionality though, too. Like it, it takes, I feel like it takes awareness, like self-awareness. And I think that's where your role is really important because I think we, like, again, we, a fish living in a fishbowl doesn't know it lives in water or in a, in a fishbowl. It just sees what it sees. <laughs> you know, we that's don't correct. know. We don't know our, ourselves um, and the things that are kind of controlling the way we view the world sometimes. So for sure, it's it's super helpful to kind of have somebody objectively observe, test, and and give insight into what you're missing in that fishbowl, right? That's right. <laughs> So do you, th do you see that people with like the unresolved trauma or even the epigenetic trauma that they have? Um, physical symptoms that sometimes are stubborn and difficult to, I know that you don't deal with the physical. That's my, my role. But yeah. <laughs> well, psychosomatic is what we usually, as a psychologist, we would probably interpret them as psychosomatic. With that being said, things like Lyme disease, it's the physiological symptoms are not necessarily psychosomatic. They're generally real nerve issues. So right. be careful with it. I, I try to really 
listen to a person and rule out everything before I assume that it is they're just somaticizing and somaticizing is not a bad thing that's the way a person expresses their pain and if you don't have words and you see this across different cultures like especially Middle Eastern culture my my uh, family in laws are Middle Eastern and this is a common presentation of anxiety you see with with certain cultures and with people uh, depending on how they present their anxiety is they they physiologically feel their anxiety. I always say to my my clients, like it, it has to go somewhere. Some people externalize and yell and scream. Some people yeah. uh, worry. They talk. You know, they talk 100 miles a minute. And some people have memory problems. And some people just they somaticize. Really, it comes right. out physically. Their joints hurt. Their physical. Their knees hurt. And it's just. Right. So yeah. So don't put a negative label yeah. on psychosomatic, yeah. is yeah, what you're not, saying. Yes, yeah. it's not. It's a. It's it's where it's going. It's how they're they're showing their pain, and it's it's how they're experiencing their emotions. So mm-hmm. it's not. Oh, it's all in your head. I mean, all your head is got your brain in it. <laughs> right. So right. Let's not minimize it. Let's just interpret it and go with it. That's good. That's really good. Thank you for yeah. saying that. I think people need to hear that because. I think a lot of people with chronic health issues, and chronic, like physical symptoms that nobody can kind of get to the root cause. They start to feel like they're crazy. Yeah. And certainly if they hear something like psychosomatic, they're going to immediately think that's negative and that, that they they're making it up. They think it's psycho fake. Right? Yeah, it's they're not psycho it up. fake. No. Yeah. No, it's real. You really are having inflammation. You really are in pain. Yeah. 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 That's so good. That's so good. Do you, do you see a difference in the genders, like in how they express um, pain symptoms and even in, like for sure in Lyme disease, that's definitely something. There are sex differences for uh, across something that it's really important, especially these days. We really need to think about biological birth sex differences Mm -hmm. because women um, who are born women, um, women definitely respond different to stress. We Mm -hmm. are women are more prone to having more severe PTSD. It's Mm. research. Mm. They're more prone to having concussions. And so I came across an article, uh, the severity of concussions. So it's easier to have, if you have multiple concussions, to have more severe symptoms as as women than it is with men. I came wow. across it. Good thing women aren't football players. <laughs> There's a reason why the Marines wouldn't let women be in the front of the line because it would have a physiological effect on us, the stress. They they wouldn't, when I was in the military, they wouldn't allow women to be at the front of the line if they were Marines. Wow. And there's a reason because it does affect our bodies differently. Um, the, the recent study I came across, they were, uh, it was an article, it wasn't a study, but it was an article and they kind of talked about things and they were saying, you know, there's something called CTE. It's uh, concu- where they basically, it's like a dementia that happens as a result of concussions mm-hmm. and they are they suggested that well this this seems to be more common with women than interesting with men. and so the severity of the emotional symptoms and of things post injury are, are substantially worse um another thing i had come across is that you know women tend you know that we have worse um responses to concussions and emotional symptoms um, when a person has Lyme disease, the treatment for Lyme tends to, if, I'm sorry, the treatment for concussions, it usually works, but when they have a Lyme disease, they don't respond to the concussion treatment. Oh. And it just, it's stubborn, it's sticky. and I think It's like it's that global inflammation of the brain has something to do with that maybe, huh? <laughs> yes, it's almost like that. Yes, it's quite interesting. So I, I really do think we need to understand the, the, um, the sex differences when we're treating people and we're mm-hmm. working with them mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, that's super, yeah. that's super helpful. Yeah, wow, that's good. Um, what, okay, I'm going to kind of bring us to a little bit of a close because I do, I want to... Um, really get to some helpful points you know i think yeah. this has been super informa- informative i think people really ha- will have walked away with a lot more kind of understanding about their own brain maybe some exposure is- risks and even maybe hopefully feel a little less crazy <laughs> but i want to leave people with kind of tools to kind of protect their brain so what do you think um are the most important things that an individual can do to protect their brains from like both 
neuro, well, mostly primarily from neurological, like neurodegenerative conditions like dementia, regardless of their starting point, what do you think are some of the most important things people can do? No, they would, people need to protect their mental health because anxiety produces cortisol, which creates people's chronic, you know, alert system and creates them to be uh, on fight or flight. So how can you rest? How can your brain rest when it's on fight or flight and you're Mm -hmm. trying to work on healing this, but you don't let your brain rest. Mm -hmm. So sleep, and I talked about sleep earlier if you have having trouble with sleep, it's a huge factor. You have to rest. So taking care of yourself, you know, keeping a balance in your life. It's not easy to achieve a work-life balance. That's kind of a, a mm-hmm. myth, I believe. But it really is a matter of keeping a balance in your life. If you are not, if you're work, 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 and then you, you don't play, you don't sleep, you don't take mm-hmm. care of your health, you don't get that break from what you're doing that's that's a big part of it another thing is people probably need to reduce their screen time Uh oh i love you for saying that thank you for saying that on this podcast (laughs) yes i know and now it's like everybody wants to be on social media and look at their screen and all the work is on screen and we work from home on computers and how many hours a day are you looking at that blue light yeah yeah. when i test patients and afterwards you know one of the especially with kids i tell parents don't let them look at a screen let their brains rest because their brain will get tired from looking at that screen so, what do, what do you think is the cause of that? What's I it? think there I think it's the blue light, it's the rays that come from the computer screen. So it feels like it's worse with with phones. Um Interesting. I, I it affects the brain ways. It, your brain has to it uses a lot of glucose to think. It uses a lot of energy mm-hmm. and when you're you're putting things that that stimulate it and it it's not able to you know filter all these things the the flicker here the lights here yeah uh, it's just too much it really is too much so you have to put that screen down and live life and be out in the presence of the world and be in the present be in the present yes be in the present yes so yeah so that's all good information what what do you think about diet or is there do you think diet is important diet is is really important. It's not just diet. You know, somebody says eat your veggies or, you know, eat, you know, don't eat carbs. It's not what you eat. It's like eating clean. It's really reading your ingredients, reducing those inflammatory oils, making sure you're eating organic when you can. You know, calories are important, but eat, but you don't want to increase any inflammation because, you know, when a person eats poorly sugar, oh my goodness, artificial colors flavors things we give my son just went to a little birthday party he's three years old and he had one chocolate cupcake and he was bouncing off the walls and fought me to sleep one cupcake and imagine what that would do long term if we're feeding right. our children this and now um you know, it, one one thing that I, I do feel like is really important and to mention, my husband had a, a, some health issues recently. And one thing that was um, asked of him was to alter his diet. And he did. And he lost a lot of weight. And the side effect of that weight loss, not just losing the weight, but being clean, nothing processed, absolutely everything had to be clean, was his emotional symptoms. He it was night and day. He's calm. He wow. responds. He doesn't react. He's just wow. night and day. So if you underestimate the impact of your mental health on with your diet, I, I highly recommend anybody working with a really well-versed nutritionist or somebody who can help you with that. I'm not a nutritionist, so I want to make sure that's clear, but working with somebody who can optimize what you need in your daily diet oh, and yeah. eat as clean as possible and read your labels, guys. Read your labels and don't give anything artificial to your kid. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, we talked about that in the ADHD episode and yeah. uh, about the the fact that it even put colors in your in your medications for like Vyvanse um, bl- blues in it and yellows. And I was like, oh my goodness, I, ironic, right? It's yes, ADHD, but it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody knows Red Forty 
is a trigger. But, you know, I don't think sometimes people don't think that they, I don't think people know where that is found. I think a lot of people know that. Maybe they don't. But Red 40 is definitely a trigger for ADHD. Even Absolutely. In, and oh a non-ADHD God. person is going to make you feel bad. <laughs> it's not good. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But you know where I found it? I couldn't believe this. This is crazy. So uh, the cupcake that you talked about there just made mm-hmm. me think about it. It is in chocolate products. So a lot of times chocolate frosting that's not homemade mm-hmm. and that powdered stuff or the chocolate frosting that you get at the store, that's going to have red 40 in it. It darkens it makes, it makes the, the brown look chocolate browner. Brown. And, you know, I found it. My we, I couldn't believe this. My daughter, she loves to eat. She loves anything sweet, not just bad, because I'm always like trying to change her whole craving patterns and everything, even working on her gut. The girl still loves to eat uh, sweet stuff. And we went to, I don't know, Christmas event in December, and they were serving hot chocolate. And typically, I don't buy it because I don't know what's in it. And if I don't know what's in it, I don't want to give it to my kids. Yeah. But it was really cold, and it was for a good cause. I think they were raising money for... uh, I think it was for sex trafficking. So I was like, all right, bye, five, whatever. My daughter handed me the hot chocolate back and said, it makes my tummy hurt. And I went back and I was like, what, which uh, hot chocolate, like what powder are you using? And it was Swiss Miss. So I went uh. to the store and I looked at the label. You guys read 40 is in Swiss oh, Miss. Oh, no, you're kidding me. <laughs> no. So I actually found that if you get the generic Kroger brand or the generic Brand it doesn't contain red. Unbelievable! 40. Get yeah, the generic. Save you money. Save you health problems, guys. It's so crazy. <laughs> it's so crazy. Anyway, so thanks for that. That was good. The diet is really important. I absolutely yeah. drive that point home all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you. I like that you talked about the fight or flight um, thing because it's something that I often mention to people, especially in chronic illness. I feel like. As, you know, when I'm finding a root cause, hey, let's just go back to Lyme for a second, because Lyme is a is a infectious ideology that the body has, it's dealing with. And this, this problem, the fact that it exists inside the body, that we've got this infection, the body's recognizing it as infection, the body's going, I got to deal with this infection, that turns on your fight or flight system, that turns mm-hmm. it on on a low dial to kind of be constant in constantly in this response period, like where it needs to be on to address an infection all the time. So that is, that's a upregulation of fight or flight. I think Uh, PTSD would be another picture of that, wouldn't it? Like where you are, you are primed and like military guys, they have to be on in defensive mode or they're going to die. So they're turning on that fight or flight and it is not like you can just press a button to turn it off. So, oh. you know, it's the same. And so when you have your fight or flight on, rest and digest, which is the balancing arm of that autonomic mm-hmm. nervous system, gets turned down really low. And that's a problem. Listen to what it said. It is. It's rest and digest. <laughs> okay. So when we di- if we have our sympathetic, our fight or flight up high, then we aren't going to detox. We're not going to digest our food, which means we're getting nutritionally deficient. You know, we're, we're, we're not going to clean any of the toxins we get exposed to. And believe me, everyone's exposed all the time to toxins. So we're just making the situation worse. And then that lack of nutrient, nutrient, that increase in toxicity then just drives that fight or flight higher. So it's a, it's a vicious, nasty cycle. So it does require some intentionality in mm-hmm. order to turn, to, to, to insist your, that you turn it off or insist that you nurture that rest and digest side, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's a, it really does take intentionality and not fear. A lot of people, what I see with therapy clients is they get scared of facing it because it, when you're doing therapy, especially trauma, it's scary because we're facing that trauma and not a, a, yeah. not a big exposure therapist. Some people are better at doing that than I am, but I am a pretty gentle therapist when it comes to trauma, but it is um, something they still have to face. So I always tell clients, it might get just a little worse before it gets better because it's going to be scary. But once we get past that hump, you're going to be doing so much better because we have to learn to face it and not be afraid of it and, and cope with it because now we know that we can do hard things. We can right. overcome it and we're still safe. Right. We're safe. You set, you're you establishing safe. the safety. You're establishing yes. that they are 
safe. And, you know, I think what you said is really good because I think it, yes, it's going to be uncomfortable to relive a trauma, but let's say we're, and, and I talk a lot about it, the childhood trauma um, linked with brain health issues. Um, if we haven't, you know, if you experience trauma as a child, you have not got a mature brain and ability to even understand that trauma in That's right. its space. So it takes until you're over 25 because the brain's then now fully developed, right? Or something like that before At you least. can actually maybe objectively review, even see the trauma for what it was. If you, you know? can even recall it, because if it happened yeah. before your explicit memory forms, your consciousness is aware, you may have not even remembered it. Right. Just, you just experience it as a, um, you know, re-experiencing symptom, a reaction and right. emotional response to their emotional reaction, not even a response, a reaction to things. And we don't even know where it's coming from, but right. it's down there deep, deep in the brain. And that's where it gets real complicated when it's really early childhood trauma. Usually yeah. that's where we look at complex PTSD instead of just a single episode. Yeah, so I, I, I just really encourage women, especially I, I think the audience here is probably, you know, late 30s, early 40s. I think those are the people that are starting to think about their brain health and definitely the ones that are having a lot of the brain fog, although I do see it younger and younger now. Um, I really encourage women and, and families and people just listening to, to really feel, seek out somebody who can help you, guide you so that you feel safe in that process, but really go through it because it is, it's important to properly place the experience into mm -hmm. the right place. Otherwise you'll continue to live that experience through a lie that your child, child self developed to protect That's itself. Right. Right. Well, so, yeah, it's your defenses. <laughs> your right. defenses. Those but defenses children, are there. Children are children, though. <laughs> children are they have to. Yeah. Well, children are children. Adaptive. So, They're yeah. adaptive. We develop defense mechanisms as adaptive responses to keep us safe. They work in them time, but they just they do not serve as long term. They become dysfunctional long term in, in right. various right. aspects. Yeah. So, yeah. That's why we need to address. For sure. We need to address that. Yeah. Oh, we covered a lot of ground today about long-term brain health, about Lyme health, about our Lyme brain, about trauma and its effect on brain, on, on the brain. I think this conversation was really important to have because trauma is absolutely under-recognized when it comes to the impact on the physical health. Um, definitely not, so. not something that we talk about. It's definitely nothing I talked about in my primary health, primary care, medical experience i'd never talked about it um now if i ever saw something that was like that i might have sent, sent up to a psychiatrist which is different than a psychologist that's right that's <laughs> um right. where they i think that they could you know benefited from psychology help and support um mm -hmm. i find it certainly i uh i am certainly limited in my ability to guide a person to excellent health if i leave hidden and undealt with trauma unaddressed left if i leave it unaddressed that's how significant trauma can impact your health so i'm very glad i got a, chan a chance to pick your brain today on this podcast as always i like to leave um my uh, audience with a small rethink it challenge <laughs> on at the end of each episode and in this episode i want to encourage people to build awareness in their lives about their emotions what do you think about that is that a good idea Build awareness in their lives about their emotions. Maybe we give somebody, if you're giving them homework assignment, something more concrete. So building yep. awareness. Happens. Here's 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 what we're gonna do, and then you yeah. tell me if it's a good idea. <laughs> All right. Uh, this challenge isn't as easy as eliminating toxic oils, like I talked about in one of my podcasts. Um, you know, get rid of your canola and switch it for ghee. Um, because I'm an '80s baby, I'm gonna call it the Dear Di Diary Challenge. <laughs> 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 even though it seems like a childish exercise i think journaling your thoughts and emotions around your daily life circumstances has a tremendous amount of benefit it helps you pick up patterns in the way you're thinking are you seeing the glass half full or half empty it helps you identify patterns about the circumstances um, about what circumstances routinely cause you an emotional response and when you see it you can ask deeper questions like why is this specific circumstance causing me constantly to be upset? If you're the on the go kind of person like me, you might enjoy audio journaling, like just pick up your phone and there's, there's 
loads of apps. Pick an app, <laughs> or you can just press a button and talk to the talk through the recorder. Record your thoughts in that audio um, recording app, and then file it somewhere private. But here's the thing: be sure to review your previous diary or journal entries at the end of the week. Most of us stay way too busy to ever be really honest and do pain, honest, painful, and healing self-reflection. But the cost in that is that you spend in the time that you spend now on this is worth the savings on your health and brain later in life. So basically, you're going to invest in your time right now journaling. That takes time, but you're going to save health and brain later in life. I always say, time is brain. Time is brain. If you put it off, you're costing brain, <laughs> brain health, right? <laughs> time is brain. We say it about stroke patients, but it's true about protecting your brain and all things. Time is brain. So you have permission at this point from me, at least, to invest in yourself in that time. Dr. Varchiani, do you have anything to add about that? No, I think this is a great thing. It's not often a homework assignment that's given to people when, they're, when they are given that modality of therapy they they do homework assignments and one common thing people do is journaling so i i think that could be great for people who are like journaling and yeah i know it's hard for the those busy folks out there but i do think it's i think that i think you in particular busy people because i am that busy person mm -hmm. i think forcing yourself to do it is important because i feel like sometimes us busy people we get busy because we don't want to deal with it okay so uh, yeah yeah busy so we don't have to think about things uh-huh i've heard that before <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so guys if you're dealing with unprocessed trauma or would like any help from an experienced neuropsychologist reach out to dr marchiani um you will not be disappointed i'm putting her a uh, link to her website in our um, show notes so you can just uh book an appointment that way in closing, I hope this episode has added a ton of value to your life, and I really look forward to talking to you guys soon. Hey guys, this is Sandy. Thanks for spending the time with me the last 30 minutes or so um, and listening to me um, share what my experiences and some of the education out there. I hope it's been a blessing. I hope it's been encouraging. I hope it has empowered you to take the next best simple steps toward recovering good brain health. If you find this content helpful, please share this content. Thank you for being patient with me as I step outside of the clinical world and into the crazy podcasting world. Uh, I appreciate you guys hanging in there on the bloopers and everything along the way. But um, for sure, if this is helpful, pass it along to someone you think might benefit from the content. Leave me a like, leave me a share on your favorite podcaster that you're tuning in on. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Until then, there is hope for lasting healing.